This session, this next session, Understanding Genetic Kidney Disease and Its Impact on the Black Community, Insights into the APOL1 Gene, um, is going to be our next topic, and you're going to really get your mind going. Dr. Stacy A. Johnson is an Associate Medical Director in Clinical Development at Vertex Pharmaceuticals in Boston, Massachusetts. Yes, she came all the way here from Boston just to speak to you. Prior to joining Vertex, Dr. Johnson spent her career helping to train medical students, residents, and nephrology fellows, and served as the Medical Director for the Acute Dialysis Unit and Plasmapheresis Service at Regional One Hospital in Memphis. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Stacy A. Johnson. First of all, thank you so much uh, to Black Health Matters for, for having me here today to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is uh, uh, kidney disease. And hopefully when you leave here today, you'll have a little bit more knowledge and uh, feel empowered to take control of your health, which is, I think, the goal of today's exercise. So um, my name is Stacy Johnson. I'm a nephrologist, but I currently work as a medical director at Vertex Pharmaceuticals based in Boston. Um, and we are at Vertex very committed to uh, developing transformative medicines that uh, tackle difficult problems. And today we're going to talk about the APOL1 gene and its role in chronic kidney disease, particularly in the African American community. Okay, so this just tells you what we're going to learn today. We're going to talk about kidney disease, talk about the burden of kidney disease uh, in society and on individuals, and then I'll tell you about APOL1 and how it may be influencing the high rates of uh, chronic kidney disease among African Americans and people of African ancestry. And then I'll share some tips about how to find out whether or not you may have the APOL1 uh, uh, um, uh, risk uh, uh, variants, as we call them, and then just give you some uh, touch a little bit on genetic testing and what kind of information and where you can go to get more information. So what are the kidneys? The kidneys are these two bean-shaped organs that sit sort of in the lower, uh, kind of lower back area, and they work 24, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day for, of your life, to filter and clean your blood. And it does this, it gets rid of, ex the kidneys get rid of excess fluid, they get rid of excess waste, they help balance electrolytes, things like salt and potassium and things like that. And they do all of that and they put all that together and produce urine. And that's what urine is. Urine is excess water, it's waste products, it's uh, uh, electrolytes that, the, that your body doesn't need. So the kidneys do a lot for you to help keep us in balance. And the main unit of the kidney is that little, you see that squiggly line over there? Let me see if I can get a pointer going here. Oh, maybe not. Okay, so you see this, this, this area here? This is like a, uh, the main sort of, the, if you had to break down your kidney into a million parts, each little part would look like this, and that's called a nephron. This area here that looks like a little tennis racket, that's, think of that as a filter. And the reason that you want filter is because your blood actually contains things that you want to keep and that they're things that you want to get rid of. So you can't just have a, a structure that lets everything out. So this filter actually does a really good job of keeping the good stuff in and letting out the waste products. But sometimes the kidneys get damaged. And when they don't work properly, you start to see some uh, signs that you can tell that the kidneys aren't working properly. So I just told you that your kidneys filter blood, uh, they get rid of excess fluid. So one of the signs that uh, the kidneys aren't working properly is accumulation of excess fluid. This might show up as swelling in your legs. It may show up as maybe even high blood pressure because your kidneys are not getting rid of extra salt. And then the other thing that happens is when that uh, tennis racket looking filter gets damaged, it can no longer do its job properly. So instead of keeping the good stuff like protein inside your body, it starts to spill the protein into the urine, which is not what you want. In the United States, the CDC estimates that approximately one in seven adults has chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease, what, we say when, what do we mean when we say chronic kidney disease? We mean 
that your kidneys are not working well and it's been going on for a long time. That's all we mean when we say chronic kidney disease. That term doesn't tell you the cause, but it does tell you that it's there, okay? And uh, the, the, the dangerous thing is that of the people, of the 37 million or so adults who have chronic kidney disease in the U.S., nine out of ten of them don't even know they have it. And chronic kidney disease, unfortunately, is progressive. And it, as it progresses, eventually it can get to the point where you need to have dialysis or a kidney transplant to uh, survive. Uh, chronic kidney disease is costly. This slide shows you what it costs to take care of uh, people with chronic kidney disease. So there's a monetary cost, but there's also a human cost because chronic kidney disease can lead to uh, people dying earlier than they really should have if they didn't have or would have if they didn't have kidney disease. So, and then you think about things like lost wages because you have to go to dialysis so you can't get to work. So chronic kidney disease is a major, major uh, uh, health um, uh, burden in, ter in, in, in our society. And so who shoulders this burden, right? So this graph uh, shows you from the year 2000 to, 2000, uh, to 2019, all the new cases of people with kidney failure. So this is like the number of people who get started on dialysis every year from the year 2000 to the year 2019. And I can tell you, if I took this graph out to 2022, it would look exactly the same. You see here who is at the top. This means that the, new, the, the, the group of people in the United States with the uh, uh, most uh, coming with new cases of kidney failure are people who identify as black or African American. Right? So even though African Americans are only 13% of the US population, they account for about 35% of the people on dialysis. So we know that there are, other things, there are lots of things that can cause kidney disease, right? Diabetes, maybe some other illnesses like in, uh, autoimmune disease, high blood pressure, can all lead to, to kidney disease. But what scientists showed back in, in 2010 is that uh, among uh, African Americans, their people who had the most severe type of kidney disease um, actually also had these changes in their DNA in a gene called apolipoprotein L1. So we call it ApoL1 for short because you can't go around saying apolipoprotein L1 all the time. So ApoL1, as it turns out, right, is a, is a, is a, a gene in the body. You, your body is full of DNA that kind of basically contains the instructions for how, uh, like the building blocks for who you are, that make you who you are, right? And one of these genes, ApoL1, has a protein in it that, as it turns out, can be helpful in some cases, but then has the um, uh, unintended consequence of increasing your risk of chronic kidney disease. And if you have a genetic condition like this, or a genetic cause of a kidney disease, then that means it runs in families. And so you see this little schematic here, where you may have two people, a biological mother, father, each of them has one of these ApoL1 variants, and they have children, and you see that um, uh, they can then share their DNA with the children, and at least one of them would end up with these ApoL1 variants that could lead to kidney disease. What do we know about ApoL1? These uh, genes uh, actually emerged in sub-Saharan Africa, Western Africa, Central Africa, thousands of years ago, and they actually had a purpose, right? So this part of the world, there was a parasite called trypanosome, and it would infect people with um, African sleeping, and cause African sleeping sickness. And it turns out that these risk variants, these changes, the G1 and G2 changes, actually protect. So if you are living your life and you have the original, what we call G0, you could be susceptible to this African sleeping sickness. If you have one copy of the, the variant, G1 or G2, you're protected against sleeping sickness and you are, don't have any increased risk of developing kidney disease. 
if you have two copies of the variant, say you got one from your biological mother, one from your biological father, you are also protected against sleeping sickness, but unfortunately, you now also carry this, these changes that can lead to you developing chronic kidney disease. And so you can say, well, Dr. Johnson, that's great. Thank you for the history lesson, but we do not live in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But our ancestors used to. And so when they moved, we moved, right? So here are the genes. And now what we have is APOL1 variants, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, like in countries like Nigeria or Ghana, um, um, but, but, but also in US, Canada, the Caribbean. I'm from Trinidad, we have that there, Jamaica. South America, Brazil, where, which got a large number of, of, of uh, enslaved people. And also in Europe, right? People who migrated uh, after, um, or maybe people who are now, you know, kind of voluntarily went to some of these countries. The key point I want to say here is that even though you have the risk variance, it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to develop chronic kidney disease. What we understand is that it's sort of like a, it makes you more likely to develop it if you have some other um, insult or other uh, thing like inflammation or high blood pressure or, um, or you get an infection. So we saw this with uh, people during the COVID epidemic who were fine and then they got developed COVID and then developed kidney failure from that. Um, and what we've noticed is that, again, when you have these two risk variants, these G1, G2, you're more susceptible to developing kidney disease. And so we can see this showing up in different ways in people. We can see people with APOL1, these risk variants, they may show up if they have autoimmune disease, it may look like lupus nephritis. They may develop uh, something called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or FSGS. People, if they develop high blood pressure, people with the two risk variants will have a more aggressive form of kidney disease and are actually more likely to end up needing dialysis than someone who has high blood pressure but doesn't have the two risk variants. And then uh, we also see it in people who have untreated uh, HIV. It could develop uh, a specific type of kidney disease that we nephrologists called HIV nephropathy. The other thing to think about and why we're talking about this today is that the symptoms of kidney disease are often very subtle in the early stages. So people might feel a little bit tired, they might notice some swelling in their feet, but then it goes away so they don't really think anything of it. They may notice that they're gaining weight, um, which it could actually be fluid. Um, and they may even have, for people who have that protein in their urine, you may develop this dark foamy urine. But unfortunately, because the symptoms are subtle, a lot of people don't go to the doctor, don't seek uh, medical attention until things get very severe. And by then, it's difficult to reverse course and change, change, change the trajectory. So how do we diagnose APOL1-mediated kidney disease? Well, first we have to see if you have kidney disease, and we can do that by a blood test, which measures something called your estimated glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. And then we also look for protein in the urine. But you know, people with kidney disease not from APOL1 can have protein and also have a lower eGFR. The thing that makes APOL1 kidney disease different is that you also have these genetic variants for the APOL1 um, uh, disease. So you have G1, G1, or G2, G2, or G1, G2. The only way to know if you have the variants is actually to have a genetic test. So genetic testing is um, something that you know, your you can talk about with your doctor, you can look, uh, use, give a, a sample of your blood or saliva, and you look for the APOL1 risk variants. It can be helpful for people because then they can, it can kind of increase their 
understanding of maybe why they have kidney disease or why their kidney disease is getting worse even though they're doing everything to stay healthy uh, and everything that they, they should be doing. Sometimes even with that, you might see things getting worse. And it can also help you talk to family members because remember, these are, this is something that's in the genes so it can potentially be passed down to family members. And also now that sci as scientists have continued to understand APOR1, we're seeing more and more clinical trials and studies looking at uh, um, uh, APOR1 and maybe testing for potential therapies. Genetic testing is not mandatory. It's a voluntary thing. You can talk about it with your doctor. If you decide to do it, you give a blood sample or saliva sample, it goes to the lab, they look for the test, they give the, the results to your doctor. Your doctor tells you what, they is and what it is and helps explain what it means. And on this slide, we just show, like you can actually have, there are all these different, uh, both commercial, but also university labs um, that offer the APOR1 genetic testing. Some of them offer a panel of genes, so you get a lot of information, not just about APOR1, but some of them offer specifically APOR1. There's also, as I told you, one of the benefits of knowing what you're, whether or not you have the, the risk variants, particularly if you have chronic kidney disease, is that there's now increasing interest in studying this, find, trying to develop therapies that could potentially help people with this condition. Um, Vertex, the company I work for, is doing a study just looking at how common are these variants in people of African ancestry who also have kidney disease. The National Institutes of Health is looking at APOL1 in people who uh, have had kidney transplant because it turns out it can affect how long your transplant lasts after you've had a kidney transplant. Um, there are also studies just building registries, looking to see, oh, okay, if people have this kidney uh, APOL1 kidney disease, how does that affect their blood pressure, their progression of kidney disease, when you know the information? And so there are lots of resources out there to tell you, uh, to give you some, uh, that you may be interested in, um, um, that could uh, be available for people with APOL1 um, kidney disease. The, uh, the, as I said, at Vertex, I mentioned that there are a lot of companies looking now into trying to find therapies. And at Vertex, we are also running a clinical trial to test the safety and efficacy of uh, uh, an investigational drug. And so if you have chronic kidney disease and you have the APOL1 risk variants, this may also be something that you can talk to your healthcare provider about. If you want to just learn more, you're just like, okay, this is a lot. I just need to learn some more and think about what to do. Here are a couple websites. The American Kidney Fund has a, a very nice page on APOR1 mediated kidney disease. NEFCURE, which does a lot of work with people with rare kidney disease. They also have a website and where you can find more information. Anybody have questions as we, as we wrap up? Okay, sure. So the question is around how do you know um, what are the parameters to look for and, and the ranges of chronic kidney disease? Right, so when you go to the doctor, you'll get a blood panel, and I'm sure many of us have seen it, and they list a bunch of different things, right? There might be a level for sodium, potassium, calcium, and then there's also something there called creatinine. And that creatinine is, creatinine is a waste product. It's not toxic, it's just... It's just made by the body through the course of life. And the only way that you get rid of it is through the urine. So what we know is that if we use the creatinine level in the blood, we can then put that into an equation to help us determine how somebody's uh, uh, kidneys are functioning. And when we use that equation, <coughs> excuse me, together with your age and whether you're male or female, we get that number called EGFR or glomerular, estimated glomerular filtration rate. And in chronic kidney disease, there are, the, we, we can stage them based on that EGFR number. So if it's above 90, it's stage one. Um, 60 to 89, uh, it's stage two. 
if you're below 60, but if you're between 30, if your EGFR is between 30 and, and, and 60, it's stage three. If your EGFR is between, so if that number is between 15 and 29, that's stage four. And anything below 15 is considered stage five, which is when, which is the most severe stage and is when people usually have to start uh, either go to a kidney transplant or get dialysis. Okay. So the question is, if since the highest proportion of people in the United States with chronic kidney disease are black, is it because of our diet or because of genetics? I think that it is probably a little bit of both. But maybe more, maybe what we're finding is that the genetic piece may actually be a much bigger role, a much bigger factor. Because, um, as I said, just because you have, uh, oh, sorry. So, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this during the talk, but when we look at the, like, how many, what percentage of, of, of African Americans have the two variants that can cause, have two copies of the variants that in, lead to increased risk, it's 14%. So 14 out of 100 have those variants. And of those people, they have like a one in five chance of developing kidney disease. And this is sometimes even when people are working out and eating healthy. Okay, is there, and the other question was, is there any way that you can reverse kidney disease? I think it depends on what you mean. So far, we cannot reverse, meaning give you back the healthy kidney that has been lost. But what we can do is slow it down so much that we can delay and delay the need for dialysis. Um, I go to my nephrologist every three months go into my diabetic every three months. And out of the clear blue sky, last year in April, I went into acute renal failure. I don't know how it happened. To this day, I had a kidney biopsy, and I'm still not happy. I understood the diagnosis. I had to go on dialysis. I went on dialysis from April 2023 until God smiled on me in August it was terminated you know I prayed I prayed and I never gave up faith because I wasn't supposed to be there I'm taking care of my A1C is 5.2 my numbers are good so how did this happen to me well a kidney biopsy said long history of being a diabetic and hypertensive, I, I, don't, I, I don't buy it. So you give me a better explanation of what happened to me. So, I'm, first of all, I'm glad that you were able to come off dialysis. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, ma'am. That's God. Time dude. spent off, off of dialysis is, 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 time, is, is time well spent. I can't give you an explanation because I don't have your medical history, right? So I, it's hard, for, I, I don't want to speculate because I don't want to give you misinformation without knowing your medical history. So I, I don't want to speculate. Hello, I was diagnosed with lupus at 60 years old and initially they found out I had lupus nephritis. So I had the biopsy and everything and I was told about the protein in my urine. So I've got off one of my medications for the protein but I've been noticing from time to time seeing the foamy urine. And is it something I'm eating or something I'm doing that's causing it to, to be like that? Because normally, sometimes it's normal and sometimes it's not. So foamy urine can be a sign of protein in the urine, but usually it doesn't really change. It doesn't, your diet could affect that, but it's unlikely. What I would say is that I think for someone who's had lupus nephritis, because the thing about lupus nephritis is that it goes into remission. It doesn't ever actually go away completely. So it goes to these quiet periods, but it may flare up. So I would say if you're concerned about what you're seeing, it doesn't hurt to talk to your provider and ask them to check your urine. 
say, can you just check my urine for protein, for blood? I've had lupus nephritis before and I want to make sure everything's okay. You said that a lot of times nine out of 10 people do not know that they have chronic kidney disease. And I just wanted to know, uh, what are some of the things that could be done in the community working closely with primary care providers as well as patients, similar to what navigators do for um, cancer patients in helping patients to understand their laboratory test results. Um, I'm a former uh, worker at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we found in some of our studies that a lot of primary care providers had records of patients' laboratory tests, such as the urine creatinine test that you mentioned, but the patients never knew about it, and the patients never got these test results, and they progressed toward uh, dialysis. And uh, I wonder what kind of educational opportunities for patients and primary care providers might um, close this gap? That is a great question because I think that, as, as someone said before I walked out here, knowledge is power. So I think one thing we can do, and uh, um, organizations like NEFCURE, uh, American Kidney Fund, um, uh, National Kidney Foundation, uh, raising awareness about chronic kidney disease. And maybe having that link of, you know, for example, um, in, the, in the primary care uh, uh, world, um, we know that if someone has diabetes, we need to monitor their kidney function, we need to check their eyes because we wanna see, because we're always looking for those early, early signs of damage to those organs. But a lot of times, if you are not diabetic or if you don't have diabetes, maybe um, we as providers are not as vigilant in checking things like just doing a urine test to see does this per person have protein. So I think we have to, um, there are two opportunities I think maybe for education. One is, with the, one is with the community and the patients so they know like, hey, I have, met, I have people in my family who've had kidney failure. I, you know, here I am with high blood pressure and I've been doing everything right. Can you please test my kidney function? I know that high blood pressure can cause kidney failure. Test my kidney function. Test my urine. Talk about, you know, should I get this genetic test? But then also we have to educate the providers to know that, hey, these are the people you need to be thinking about looking for kidney disease. And even if the results may be, I talked about the stages, I think a lot of times we see the, somebody with an EGFR in the stage one or stage two range and we feel comfortable about that. But really we should, that should just clue us in that okay, this is something I'm gonna need to follow. And I should tell this person, I used to tell my patients all the time, I was like, listen, when you, you know, tell people, when they came to me, or usually when they came, by the time they saw, saw me, their kidney function was a lot worse than stage one or two. But I would always say, it's like, look, this, when, you, when you go to your other doctors, tell them you have kidney function, kidney, kidney disease. Tell them, you know, your, doc, your kidney doctor told you your kidneys are working at about 50%. So then they can know maybe to make sure that they, uh, if they need to change medications, because there are medicines that, that are cleared by the kidney that you might need to adjust as someone's kidney function goes down. And I would always just encourage providers to talk to each other. Talk to each other. If you're not sure, pick up the phone and call the nephrologist or the nephrologist should call the primary care doctor and just say, this is what I'm doing with your patient. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. <laughs>